Dennis and I always had a heart for orphans and did short-term missions. We were faithfully serving God in our church, but we just really felt something was missing. I was a building contractor uh, pretty much for the last 15, 20 years. We were very active in a church. I believe God really ordained our steps. I heard a speaker and she was sharing on Sudan and all the atrocities. And I hadn't even heard about what was happening in Sudan. I was on my knees crying and I said, God, what can we do? You know, what can I do? And I'll never forget it was so loud and clear. He said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Four months after that, I was on a plane with four others coming in in, I think it was 98, to see if Sudan was really as bad as everyone was saying. I am born here in the town of Ye, 10th of May, 1955. That was the beginning of the war because early that morning, just about 10 minutes when I was born, uh, the first killing started in this uh, town of Ye. After all the nurses, the midwives, the doctors had escaped, she too has escaped with me. And she was still in pain. She still had blood on her body. And then I still had my umbilical cord freshly cut. So she went with me to the bush for three days, hiding with me. Many people say our war it's not a religious war. That's a very big lie. It's a very big lie. Politically, well, we say we are not fighting Muslims because they are Muslims, and Muslims say they are not fighting us because we are Christians. Politically, that's what they preach. On CNN, on BBC, that's what they say. When you interview them, that's what they say. But the reality, our war has been very much fueled up because of our religious indifferences. But people have no choice. It became a part of life, of course. If something has been going for a quite long time, it becomes a part of life. So what, what do you do? You see one, today you see a relative dying, you see your child dying, you see your friend dying, and, and you think, when will your time come? And, and, and because of that, it has made the church so strong because we know that we had no hope other than believing and trusting in God. Dennis came in in 2001 and met Bishop Elias Taban and with officials in the south here, you know, and they showed him different pieces of land and felt that this area was the most secure. It was all bush. The first couple buildings were all by hand, even cutting the trees, it was all by axes. Once word got around that we were taking orphans, uh, they, were just, they were just flooding in. And uh, there was several times that you had just had to say no because there was no room and we just weren't ready uh, for the massive amount of numbers. Sometimes you would hear later that uh, the children that we didn't take would die. And so it's like, oh, you know, you know, what was I, was I to do to that one, Lord? All the decisions we make aren't gonna be the right decisions. And we have to live with that tomorrow. If the person dies or sick or whatever the case may be. But we've learned that if we become faint, what about the rest of the kids tomorrow? You know, there was, a lot more people walking around naturally with AK-47s and, you know, we drove around with armed guards in the beginning, usually quite a bit. And, I mean, you never drove at night. The Antonov is actually a Russian plane that the North has. Mm -hmm. And that's what would come down and um, they would either bomb churches or the market where a lot of people were gathered. And they used to bomb daily. <clears throat> and it would bomb usually in this area up here more in town. Um, we have around 95 orphans right now that are living here. And then we have about 55 local employees. Most of them, probably 30 of them live here and help care for the children and cooks and guards. And then we have a um, school that has approximately 430 to 440 students. And they come and they have one meal and then they go back to their villages. Because of the war, I mean, there isn't any infrastructure. There's really hardly any education. When the local tribe uh, handed this land over to us, in that process, we told them that we would educate their children without a school fee. Well, we believe that we're raising up future leaders, that it's education and the Word of God that will help build New Sudan. When God called Dennis and I, we believe he really gave us a name. It's Harvesters Reaching the Nations. Um, it's not Dennis and I reaching the nation. So we really believe that God will even bring in other organizations or people to partner with harvesters um, so we can all work together in advancing the kingdom of God, but we're taking a holistic approach 
you know, feeding, clothing, educating, and most of all, teaching them the Word of God, discipling them, because it's, it's discipleship that will really change, you know, a person. Expansion is in our plan. Uh, that will be, of course, under God's direction. We've been really blessed and appreciative of what God has done here at Harvester, and we see the growth. And the government in the South here has asked if we would take and duplicate this in the other, there's five regions in Southern Sudan. We need more long-term people to come in and partner with us. Every week, every hour is a new adventure. And there are some days where you feel like, oh, you know, this isn't working, that isn't working, and then blessings come. And blessings always follow uh, the difficult times. There's no greater joy in the midst of the hardest thing we've ever done than doing God's perfect will for our lives. We know that God's called us to do this. Even though it's difficult, there's no greater joy. I would really want to challenge people. Um, the simple question, what I, you know, ask God, what can we do? And be willing to do that and listen to Him. I mean, the harvest is so ripe. It really is. And when you're in the States, you hear that, you know, and you don't really comprehend it until you're out here and see the need is so great. And life is so short.